So any questions on internal loads? I, I do. So we talk about occupant load, but on these, I usually see that on the summary sheet, but that's not always included. The specific number of bedrooms, the occupant load. So if that's not included, but we're looking at the loads themselves, what's a good way to... It's going to be in the worksheets. Okay. And I think I have a slide in here. Oh, stop me if I don't. I'm or I can ask you after. No, I'm pretty sure I have. A, I'm pretty sure I have a slide in here with it. Okay. This, I think I mentioned this in the first. One. Invariably, I know I mentioned it. Invariably, I I wait till the last to go through this, and everybody's mind is on and everything. And so that's why we try to touch on it as we go through. Okay. So that we're not trying to rush through it at the end. Um, but yeah, we'll <clears throat> we'll kind of summarize, and as we go deeper into the worksheets, you'll see it. And you'll see what we're doing on the worksheets. So internal loads are heat that we generate inside. Remember, we said it is only considered, we only worry about it in our design for summertime. In the wintertime, if we generate some heat in the house, great. You know what I mean? It's like we used to, and this is something that we've noticed is with light bulbs now. We're not getting any heat off our light bulbs. We're not heating anything with light bulbs. Uh, and we're used to an incandescent light bulb. If you, if it consumes 100 watts, 90% of it or 90 watts is making heat. And I want to close that, please. That's the beauty of electricity. It's 100% efficient at making. Yep. Well, electricity generally is might not be the cheapest. It's not the cheapest. But it, the use of electricity creates heat. Yep. Yeah. And and so an, an incandescent light bulb. I mean, those of us with hair this color, we know that we used to take a drop light in the middle of the winter, right? You just hang the drop light down in the under the hood of your vehicle, and your engine was warm yeah. because of all the heat that comes off the light bulb. All the stickers in your light fixtures that say no more than a 60 watt light bulb is because you burned the house down with 100 watt light bulbs in there. And, and so 90% is heat and 10% is light. Uh, <clears throat> my daughter bought a house, oh, it's been six or seven years ago. And she bought it, they bought it from a guy that was an electrician and had 96 cam lights in it. And guess what was in every can light? Incandescent light bulbs. Or he what was, I, did he have dimmers on them? Yeah, I had dimmers on some of them. Yeah, I've been smoking dimmers like crazy. Yeah, oh, they had all kinds of problems. And they had a bunch of little kids, you know? And when I walked through the house, I, I told my son-in-law, who's a, an accountant, I said, Jared, you're gonna need to change the light bulbs. I am okay, and it, you know, he's kind of tight. You know what I mean? And they'd been there like a year and a half, and it was the summer. And Chrissy called me and said, "Dad, the power company says they're going to have to raise our equal pay because we're using about four hundred dollars a month in the summertime." And she said, "Do you think if we change the light bulbs, it's going to make a difference?" I said, "Yeah, it's going to make a difference." And uh, Costco had a sale, you know, where with the rebates and all that stuff, and so they changed them all out. <clears throat> and over the the next year, she reduced her summer electrical consumption by about 38%. Because not only did she save all that waste and heat that was being made by the light bulbs, but she didn't have to remove it with the air conditioner. So oh, even just the lighting the water. Yeah. The kids, like, the, the kids could leave on all the lights and it was cost them a quarter or a fifth less to have the lights left on. But at least she wasn't paying to remove all that extra heat from the house. So, what's another internal load? Kathy walked in here a little bit ago. This is weird breaking. And she, said, she said, Oh, it's nice and warm in here. People looking. Just general living. Well, you have 20 something people in here in a fairly small room. It's not really cold outside. 
would like some heat, right? Yeah, Delta Center, which is not called that anymore, I'm more practice well. Villa. You run an AC on a big fan. You don't want that. Because there's enough body heat going down. I don't know how many of you paid attention to large commercial buildings, but a larger commercial building cools the middle of the building 365 every day of the year because it doesn't lose any heat because it's surrounded by conditioned space, but it gains all the heat from the office work, the, everything that's going on inside the space. So. For residential, it's fairly simple. We just account for um, some of the uh, stuff that's going on. Like I said, not every light bulb. If, if we took the range, now let's compare this to commercial restaurant. Commercial restaurant, they have the flat top griddle heated up all, all day long, right? How many of you ever use all four burners on the top of your stove at one time? Uh, Almost never. I can't ever think of. I've never used my central grid or my central burner. This guy, mine's got five. I've never yeah. used the middle one. We have a middle one and it doesn't work that good anyway. It has hot spots and stuff. But, yeah. but we, I, I never, you know, we might use two at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And even at Thanksgiving, you might use two or three. But yeah, and you have your oven on. But we don't. So what I'm saying is we don't say, oh, well, the oven is this many watts, and so we're going to figure that they're all going to be on all the time. Manual J, one of the simplifications or the assumption that it makes is that everything's not on all, on all the time, and we're just they just make assumptions based on typical usage. And so you cook, yeah, you're going to be a little warm in your kitchen for a little bit, but then it's... For 20, 20 minutes or an hour or something like that. Yeah, two more. Yeah, yeah open a window. Um, when I was younger, and my wife would say, Well, the house is hot. And I would say, Well, that's because you make bread. But now I don't say anything because I prefer the baked bread rather than the house being a few degrees warm once in a while. Yeah, if you have homemade bread, you know, it's pretty hard to beat, isn't it? <clears throat> so anyway, if there's something unusual, just ask for a justification. So here's our worksheet. Look at that. It was the next slide. And so what I've done, if you go to page eight of your of your load, and that's it. And of course I can't fit it all on the page. But page eight. Open that up. And so I've just included the top of it so that we could talk about that in a minute here. But here's down lower on the sheet, and you see where it says 13 internal gains. See that? Yeah. Occupants at, at 230, seven of them. Here's our number. Now, I, while we're on this page, I want to point something out. If you look through there, you have a bunch of pages that look the same, worksheet pages. If you look at the very first page, what do you see right here? Entire house. So that first column is the entire house. So here's our walls with glass and a door, and wall with glass, wall with glass. So here's all the components of the thermal envelope, ceilings and floors, all those things we've talked about. And here's the total for the entire house. And then the next one is kitchen dining room. And then as you go on through the pages, we have a column for every room that we've identified on the load. Does that make sense? So we can break down, and if you flip to page... Nine has the family room and the master suite. So, and I don't have a slide for it, but if you go to page nine, the right hand column is the master suite. And you can just pick that master bedroom and look through it and see if it 
Looks right. Staying back on this one because I have a slide up. So the kitchen dining room. You notice that if it's a north, if it has a north facing wall, 2D OSW, that wall, there'll be a number there. If we look at it, um, the kitchen dining room has north walls, right? And then we have something here, northeast, so it has a bay or something on it. And then we come down here, uh, we have a little piece of west. And so we only have something in that row if it's included in that room. That makes sense? So it's just a breakdown of each room on the worksheets. Now something to watch for that I get a lot of questions on. It says kitchen dining room. 31.1 feet of exposed wall. So that's how the length of the exposed wall. But then it comes down here and it says room dimension and it says one foot by 279 feet. Why does it do that? And if you look at a lot of load calculations, you, you're going, why does it do that? Because it shows up. Rysock doesn't know how to put in an irregular shape room. So if you have a 12 by 14 room, but it has two bays sticking out on it and stuff, it just says, we're not going to try to describe it in its dimension, so we're just going to call it 1 by 279 because 279 is the total square footage in the world. So don't let that throw you. That's what's happening is it's telling you it's in an irregular shape room. And sure enough, the room area is 279. And if you look at your plan, you're going to see it's not a rectangle or a square. It's a irregular shape room. You know, it might have an L shape or it might have something like that. Versus like the master bathroom is actually giving dimensions. Yeah, because it's a rectangle, right? Yeah, so that's all it is. Um, but as we look down it, here's our orientation that we talked about at the first, right? So that's why I say I pick a room, see if it matches what the plans are telling you. That we have 135 square feet of gross wall that's facing north. Using, using their their wall height numbers. Yeah, the wall height number is here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now someplace, and I don't get too hung up on it, someplace rim joists needs to be accounted for. Whether you put it in the room above or you put it in the room below. But rim joists should be accounted for because it's wall. Right. Does that really matter though that much? I know, I know it's a cavity, but it's kind of like. I'm not going to send it back, but. I, I'm really bothered with that just because yeah. you have a building a little closer. Yeah. But anyway. Well, you have a one foot wide strip yeah, that, that is yeah. part of it. So. It's detail on the plans, I'm busy. Yeah. About that. Yeah. Uh, I, the big thing on rim joists is really mm -hmm. rim joists don't get an air barrier on like they're supposed to. A rim joist is a wall, right? What do we what do we need on fiberglass insulation to really make the fiberglass insulation work? Being closed on all six sides. Right? How do you enclose rim joist insulation on all six sides with an air barrier? Unless you had specially named pieces that had an air barrier on all six sides. Well you take a piece of Tyvek or OSB or drywall, and you cut it to fit in the rim joist, put all the insulation, then you call it every one. Drywall is the easiest way, but that's the point nobody's going to do. So what, how do you do it? Spray foam, close cell spray foam. And that's something that's in that table that people say, well, we're going to do the table. We're not going to blow it or test. And the table says the rim joist will include the air barrier on all sides. So the only way you can do it is spray foam in your rim joist. Or put foam on the outside. Well, probably an Yeah. 
when you say air barrier all sides, yeah. explain that. If they have an air barrier, if their seating goes all the way down to the foundation wall, the air barrier the outside all the way down. Once so the you still have something to count the inside of the doors. If you have a cap, you have a stud space, right? And you would put fiberglass backs in it. Mm -hmm. We enclose it on all six sides with a top plate, bottom plate, side size, sure. OSB, and drywall. If we have a knee wall going into an attic, you know, with the attic on one side, the code's very specific. It has been for several years that you need an air barrier on the back side. Why? Because that, <clears throat> that cavity, this side has drywall on it, this side is just open fiberglass. Does insulation, fiberglass insulation work if air is moving through it? It's like you put a sweater on and it's breezy out there. Does the sweater work? No, you put what on it? You put on a windbreaker, right? The insulation needs a windbreaker. So we put it up and you're saying, well, how's the wind going to blow through it? It's the same thing as the window. We have the insulation that's in the cavity. We have the drywall here. The air in the attic is cold. <clears throat> We get some migration um, in and out of the insulation. So, what's the temperature of the air on the back side of the sheetrock? It's a little warmer because it's getting heat from inside. So, what does the air do? It rises. So, it rises and then it gets to the top and, what is it? and it comes out, and cold air gets pulled in the bottom. And so, if you have vertical insulation, Without that air barrier on the sixth last side, you will get a convective flow. When you get a convective flow, you also get a moisture issue because you're pulling that moisture out of that, that air space. On yeah, the you have the potential of moisture issues, but but when you have air moving through insulation, the R value just plummets. And so um, the code says you are supposed to install insulation installation for manufacturer's installation requirements and all the manufacturers say enclose it on all six sides and they say cut and fit around the boxes and split it for plumbing pipes and everything but we don't make them do it you know if we really and i'm guilty of it as anybody if we really made them install fiberglass bats properly they would finally throw up their hands and say oh the hell with it i'm just in a net and blow it because then it fits everywhere right and, and, but then you still need the air barrier. So the same thing applies with the rim joist because it's a vertical thing and we'll get that same convective flow. And if you go to the table in the energy code, it says do that. Now, to be honest with you, Manual J is assuming that it's going to be built in accordance with standard practices and we're going to have some of those things taking place. And it's made some assumptions that. Yeah, the insulation is not going to be perfect. And it accounts for it. So there's our internal gains. Let's go up another line, and I might have this slide in here again. 12A, it says infiltration. And we talked about that earlier. Remember when we picked it out of the table? And it's telling us what our load is for heating and cooling due to that infiltration. Then it says room ventilation and it says zero. Why does it say zero? Because this house is not planning on putting mechanical ventilation in it, which would be a fan running all the time or something to always exchange a little bit of air. But if it was planning on it, it would show the Then down. we should put it there. Now I see people put in a whole bunch of ventilation air again so they can make the system bigger. When you look at the duct system or you look at the house plan, there's nothing. There's no indication of the of ventilation system. So, you know, we're just trying to anticipate and understand how the envelope's being built. Any questions on that? We could spend a lot of time and we could go through every room in the house and verify it. Don't do that. Pick a room and just take a look at it. First glance at this, and this looks really confusing. 
all these numbers, but it's really, this describes, there's a W for wall, glass, and a door. And then these numbers here all coincide with numbers in manual J that describe the assembly. What's this column? It's the U. And so rather construction components, you can go to this one and you can verify U factors. Remember we talking about HTM? What's HTM? It's the U times the delta T. And there's those numbers. Notice it says gross area. And then your net, heating load, cooling load, and that's for the whole house. And then it totals up down here just like that short form right of the person. So there's tons of information on that page. Ducks. If you show the ducks are in the attic, Manual J is going to nail you for a lot of heat gain, especially in a, in a hot climate where the attics get hot. And it's going to nail you for a fair amount of heat loss in the summertime. Now, I think we mentioned or we talked earlier about this impacts your attic insulation. And that's a legitimate concern. But if we think about it, how much are we going to get underneath? We're going to get three and a half inches. So it's going to be someplace between our 13 and our 15 underneath. Then what's the thickness of the insulation or what's our value of the duct? It's our eight. So you have eight on top of that down at the bottom. And then we have insulation around the sides a little bit. And then we have this R8 exposed on top. So this isn't as bad as if we hung the duct all the way up. We could spend a lot of time crunching a bunch of numbers. The amount of insulation lost in our ceiling because of the ducts in buried in the insulation doesn't have near the impact that we have if we raise the duct up so the entire circumference of the duct is exposed to that hot attic or that cold attic. Because then we're exposing the whole thing to just R8 insulation, not, you know, right now we're just showing part of it to R8. The other thing, when we put a lot of duct in there and we bury it in the insulation, the insulation guy takes the square footage of the attic and does what? Counts how many bags he has to put in. And so when you have ducts taking space, you end up with deeper insulation because he's still going to put 18 bags or whatever his calculation is. So is the cost difference between doing like under slab and heating, is it like crazy, crazy amounts? Is that why we're not seeing it as often? Under slab ductwork is extremely labor intensive. Um, when I was 20 doing HVAC, I was the guy that did all of them because it's shovel time, and uh, and then you have all the you have to slope to places that you can pump water out if it gets into it. And we have a big debate, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail. Is duct underneath slab outside or inside the thermal envelope. It's outside the envelope. You said outside? Yeah. And you said inside. I said inside. If it's logical, why are you outside? Where do we insulate? Where do we insulate? If it's slab on grade, where do we insulate? We insulate around the perimeter. I'm making two arguments. I'm making the argument that it's inside the thermal envelope and it's outside, the, or it's outside the thermal envelope. If we want to call it the slab, but we don't. That? We don't don't insulate the slab, do we? Not normally. Not norm. Not under it. Yeah. We insulate around the. Around it. That's why. That's why I was thinking how much of that insulation that's surrounding a walkout basement, if you had underground mechanical, is going to affect 
that internal ducting. Thing. You insulate under a radiant. We had to insulate. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do it for your? Well, we, why don't we insulate under radiant piping? Uh, so because we have the delta T, the temperature difference. Mm -hmm. The ground is 50, 55 degrees. So if you put air conditioning only under slab, there is no reason you should ever worry about insulating because the temperature of the ground is the same as the temperature of your air conditioned air. And moisture is much a problem because you're using plastic pipe. Yep. You use and then you seal it and, and everything. So the code has not been very specific. The, um, the way the code says it's outside the thermal envelope, that's ICC says it's outside the thermal envelope, so you have to insulate it to R6. It's not an attic, so it doesn't have to be R8, it has to be R6. So we can make them spend thousands of dollars to spray closed cell foam on it. And guess what? When you test it, it really doesn't make an appreciable difference. In fact, have you seen the blue duct and the black max duct that they put underground? The companies that manufacture that stuff have done some testing. I can't remember what the name of the test is, but it's it's actually in the 21 code. There's an acronym for it. But anyway, there's a test, and they take conventional, you know, like metal duct or something like the plastic coated PVC spiral, the PBS, and they insulate it to R6. And then they take those PVC products and put 100 feet of it in the ground, blow air through it at a certain temperature, measure the temperature of the inlet and the outlet. And they're not measuring any appreciable difference because we're not putting it in a real brutal cold environment. And PVC pipe by its nature provides some insulated value and it just doesn't make a big enough difference. And so when people say, do I have to insulate underground duct? I say, you guys make the decision yourself. I don't think you have to. So, I don't know. It really, you know, I mean, you can say, well, bury it in gravel and we have air spaces and all the gravel and maybe we'll heat up the gravel a little bit. And we'll just make the basement a little more comfortable because the heat, the heat doesn't really drive down. No, it's kind of it kind of tends to stay to the top. And essentially radiant heat. Yeah. So but if you have if you have insulation under a slab, you need to account for it in your load calculation. And I can see why we put it under a heated slab, because we don't want to be you know, we have a greater temperature difference. How high do we keep those slabs? Sometimes we're 100 degrees. You know, if it's really cold outside, we need to put some serious heat into the um, into the building. Then it gets pretty warm, and we don't want that. You know, it's like heated driveways. Do you insulate under a heated driveway? And they say, yeah, we should insulate under a heated driveway. But guess what? If you have snow early in the season or later in the season when the ground's warm, the one that has insulation underneath that has to run the snow melt system where... There's an art form of that too. Cause, there is. Because what happens is if you if you overheat or have cold spots, you'll end up creating a insulated barrier with the water and the ice on top that, of it. And then it'll never melt. Yeah. So it, if you don't have even heating and you don't have it drained properly, it, it's, it's a little bit of an art form. Yeah, it, it really is. It's a lot more technical than it looks at first. Heated driveways are exactly the first part of the problem. <laughs> Guess what? My house faces north. <laughs> Guess what we're thinking real hard about? Heated driveways. Heated front steps and heated sidewalks. We require heated driveways. You have to slope with more than. 4% or something because of the fire emergency services yeah. engagement, so they had to keep the driveway so that it was level enough that you could somewhat walk on it. Yeah, and don't get hurt. Yes, yeah. for emergency services. Well, we had some snow the other day. What they did, what was yesterday morning? 
And uh, I looked outside, it was just a little bit, and you could see exactly where my driveway is shaded all day long because back further out, the concrete was already warm enough from the previous day's heating, but where I have frost in the ground and everything because it hasn't seen the sunshine all winter long, I had snow on my driveway. Whatever we have, we need to account for it. The number one thing is we're looking at these. Please don't make your contractors suspend their ducts up out of the installation. Have them bury it in the insulation. Um, and better yet, get it out of there if they can. Um, our six foot crawl space, our eight per attic, account for it on your load calculation. Bubble foil insulation, you know, this stuff. If you read what it says right there, it'll say R8 with two air spaces. When you just rub that, wrap that quarter inch bubble stuff around a duct type, it's like R1. So if they're using any of those bubble products, you need to get the installation instructions. This product requires two layers with a three quarter inch air space and little spacers and everything to get R8. And all of your seams have to be taped. So it's airtight. How good is a coat for insulation if your coat's unzipped and wide open? If you wrap this stuff around there and you have it opened so that air can move through it, it's doing nothing because we have the environment of the attic in there. Those materials you need to have manufacturer's instructions. They do make a thicker stuff. They call it Big 8 or Super Bubble. And this will get R8 if you wrap a strip around and then put this around it. You see what they're doing? Um, and create their space. But this has to be completely sealed. Get it out of the attic. Get it out of the other conditioned space. Or if you're going to put it in the unconditioned space, make sure it's truly insulated well. And then account for it. So we actually adopted by amendment in 2019 that we get some credit in our load calculations if we get a minimum R19 over the top of the duct. But you still need to have an insulated duct. And um, if you want to call it inside the thermal envelope, you have to test it really, really tight. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because it's kind of an energy code thing, but I just wanted to let you know that that's in the code and it's really being addressed in the two codes. But whatever the case, you need to put, they need to put the ductwork in the location that's located. Whole house ventilation. Now I mentioned I'm putting a, a new fan in my master bath. And I'm going to set it to run continuously at around 60, 70 CFM. It'll run all the time, exhausting out of my master bathroom. Can I count, count that as a whole house ventilation system? I can. The code doesn't say the whole house ventilation system needs to be in the direct center of the house or anything. What the code says, it can be an exhaust fan, it can be a supply fan, or it can be a combination of supply and exhaust. And as long as the house isn't super tight, you can get away with exhaust only. So when I put that fan in and it's running all the time, what will, where will it get air to replace what I exhaust? I don't have to crack a window in the other bathroom. Because guess what? My house leaks enough, and your house leaks enough, and every house leaks enough until you get really, really tight, and you spray foam everywhere, or you build ICF and then spray and encapsulate your attic. It will leak enough to replace. Remember we talked about the infiltration? And even a really tight house will leak the whole volume of the house every 
for yeah. five or six hours. So if I'm exhausting 70 CFM, I can easily, easily replace it. What's the kind of golden number if I exhaust too much air? What's the point that the house can't leak enough? And there's a number that's just been kind of arrived at, and it's in the code. Is there some place in the code that it says if you have a fan moving more than 400 CFM? Right? You have to have a way to make it up. You have to have a way to make it up. So if we have a smaller fan, right? You have to have a way to make it up. So if we have a smaller fan, it's going to make up itself just by leakage. It's really hard to get a house down real, real tight. There are just so many little places for air to leak. Even if you just look at the weep holes in your windows and, and stuff like that. It's really hard to get it super tight. So whole house ventilation literally helps you keep the humidity under control, especially in our dry climate. Keeps the air quality. What are the air quality things that we're worried about? Combustion air. Well, we worry about combustion air, so we try to we try to avoid that. But what what air quality things? Do we? Could we potentially have an air quality issue in this room today? <laughs> Due to what? Yeah. Now I'm going to assume that everybody bathed recently, and so that that's not the problem. But just as sitting here, can we have an air quality problem? It's too tight. Carbon dioxide. Yeah. Carbon dioxide. Is anybody not? Breathing right now. <laughs> we, we we expel carbon dioxide, and you have a big room like this with 18, 20, whatever people in here, and we actually have in the energy code that in a commercial building we're supposed to have demand controlled ventilation that measures what carbon dioxide. And brings in fresh air. Look, look in the energy code in the commercial code for demand control ventilation. That's what it is. When you have meeting rooms that reach a certain threshold, we're supposed to have demand control ventilation where we ventilate based on the demand. So, anyway, moisture is a big one, air quality is a big one. I have a gas range. Anybody else have a gas range? Love my gas range, but what does it do? It puts carbon monoxide and it puts all kinds of crap in the air, so we need to ventilate. We have, we buy all this stuff that's manufactured wherever, and we have all this chemical outgassing. You know, you ever opened an Amazon box from like bought face masks that were made in China and you put the face mask on and what do I smell? That chemical smell? Carpets. What was the wood floor stuff that was formaldehydes and everything like that? So we have a lot of manufactured products that put contaminants in the air. Um, and so mechanical ventilation needs to be accounted for if they are providing it in the house. It needs to be accounted for on your load. Right here, room ventilation, and there should be something there. If we did not amend the code in Utah, the energy code in Utah, every house would be lower door tested, and every house would have to reach a tightness level that requires mechanical ventilation. So what I'm saying is we have an amended code here that gives us some options that we don't have to lower door test. And so we don't hit that trigger, so we don't make them do mechanical ventilation. But every house really should, built today, should have mechanical ventilation just to help minimize the chance of condensation um, occurring in the walls and to maintain air quality. And we're kind of living in a time that isn't good ventilation kind of priority. Okay. So we can exhaust only, and that's what I'm going to be doing upstairs, one end of my house, and then I'll just allow it to leak in. 
We can bring in some air into our furnace with a balancing damper and stuff, but then our furnace has to run all the time to provide continuous ventilation and that will be wasteful. Or we can put an energy recovery ventilator, which exhausts, we recover the heat out of the exhausted air and use it to heat the fresh air that we're bringing back in with it. Most efficient way, but it's most expensive. In any case, the code requires this or this or this to have a high efficiency fan in it. So you can't use a cheap bath fan because they use too much energy to do it. And beside that, that drives you crazy with it rattling the way all day. And that high efficiency fan that you wore, that still fits into the same housing and everything? Because like the cheap fans, or did you have to replace all the housing? Oh, it's a whole fan. No, I mean like you it, put- It's complete housing and everything. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you'd have to yeah. change. Yeah, it's, it's not this little housing that's 12 by 12. It's not, it's not one of the plug and go units. It's, it's not a $12 fan. Uh, it, the one I bought has a speed control so I can set it and run at 70. I can go in, I can either hit a timer or moisture can turn it on to a high speed. I can program how long it stays on high speed then goes back to 70. Um, so I have a moisture sensor. I didn't buy the occupancy sensor, I just have a switch that you just touch and it'll run for 20 minutes at high speed. But I'm into it about 325 bucks. Yeah. So it's... Well, I'm just thinking, you know, if I wanted to remodel the bathroom but not replace the ceiling, how easy it would be to change out for something like that. Well, they, they have little retrofit kits so you can change them, but you'll spend a hundred and a half for right. uh, a basic high efficiency fan. Which is fine. Which is fine. The, the, the motors literally draw about what your Norvell transformer draws. I mean, they're, they're that efficient. They're super efficient. Right. And they're, they are made to run continuously. So whatever you do, you need to account for it in your load calculation. It should be there. And like we saw on the line, there's a place to put it. So here's the air handler, the furnace bringing in some outside air with a <coughs> balancing damper and an electric damper that opens if you're not running it all the time. Here's the type of fan I put in. Now I had mine come with a light too. And then there's energy recovery ventilator. If you're not familiar with these, go on YouTube and spend a little time because they recover between 60 and 80% of the heat and the air you're throwing away and preheat the fresh air you're bringing in. Um, and they're pretty slick, but they get really pricey in a hurry by the time you duck them in and everything. So yeah, ventilation, room ventilation at zero on this one because they, they're relying on the air leakage to maintain air quality. What's the problem with that? If you're allowing leakage to maintain your air quality, we don't move it through the whole house. When I say we change all the air in our house in, it, in three hours, we change the full volume of our house in three hours. But generally, what's it doing? It's leaking in and out of the outside wall. It's not flowing all the way through the house so that we flush the whole house clean. It just comes in and out the outside wall so we don't get it where, where we want the air quality maintained you know, in our living space. Um, Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to cover on, on Manual J. So just summarizing real quick, we look at the entire thermal envelope, we do an analysis and calculate how much heat is lost through every square foot in the winter time, how much heat is gained through every square foot. We look at how much air we leak in and out we consider, you know, what's leaking around the, what heat we lose around the slab edge, what goes through the attic. We look at all those, and if we accurately put in all that data, we should get a fairly accurate load of how much heat we're going to need or how much cooling we're going to need to maintain our design temperature. Then the next step is how do we make sure we deliver it to the rooms that we need it? How do we ensure that 
like the kitchen dining room and the summertime gets 3,221 BTUs of cooling capacity in that room. Yeah, you have to make sure you have the return path. Now, how does it, and that's something a lot of people don't understand very well, is um, what does a furnace do? Does everybody have a gas furnace in here? No? A gas boiler. You have a boiler, okay. With radiators, or do you have radiant heat in the floor? Radiators. Okay. So he has a little bit different type of system. But if you have a forced air system, we have supply air or warm air coming out of the registers in the wintertime, right? And it comes out and it circulates through your house back to a return air, and it just goes round and round. You know, we blow a certain amount out, we bring the same amount back. We don't create air out of nothing. <coughs> that furnace won't blow out any more air than it gets returned to it. If you restrict the return air by a dirty filter or something, you get less air out of the supply, right? So the system's not going to work if, if we can't get the return back. And for years and years and years, we really didn't worry about it. You put a big central return in the hallway, and then you blow all the supply out into the various rooms of the house, and they seem to work pretty good. The better we build a house, though, if we close a door, our bedroom might be cold, right? Because it can't circulate back. If it can't circulate back, how are we going to get the airflow? You know, it kind of pressurizes the room and we don't get the supply there. If it's an old leaky house, we pressurize the room and it just leaks to outside. And where the return is, it just sucks air from outside to replace what leaked outside. And so it just makes it really inefficient. So our return is an important thing, but how we deliver the airflow really, really makes a big difference. And so, studies show the actual airflow falls short of design CFM in 94% of the systems tested. Fittings rarely include turning lanes or radius inside throats. And I'm going to tell everybody here, please consider focusing a little more on our duct systems and less on if you're designed at 95 or at 98. So from our load calculation, we need to have our room by room CFM. And do we have it right here? We have it. We need our manufacturer's blower data. And we don't have that in there. We need device and accessory pressure drops. So what do we put in that air stream that will restrict airflow? We put, we put air filters, we put air conditioning coils, we might put lights, that infra, um, ultraviolet lights, we might put humidifiers that stick into our duct stream, air stream. Um, so anything that's going to restrict airflow. So we need to do a friction rate, rate worksheet to identify those. And from that, we find out how much we look at all the devices we put in there, and it includes registers and grills. And we look at, OK, after we put all those devices in, do we have any air left for the duct system? Because we're going to have losses in our duct system. So we're going to come up with these are things we're going to talk about a total equivalent length. I, uh, I have a picture in here. My house, when I bought it, that I'm in now, had some real problems with the duct system. And the way we size duct systems is we assign equivalent lengths to fittings. So if you look at your house and you know your basement where you have supply air coming off the top of the duct with an elbow, and then it goes over into a boot and blows up into your house, that elbow out of the top of the duct, just making that turn, 
is equivalent to someplace between 35 and 65 feet of straight duct. The turn coming right off the top of your furnace can be equivalent to 120 feet of straight duct just because it's kind of a kink in the system. So we're, we're going to define that so you can understand it. A friction rate design value in our duct system, our branch and trunk size is our return path. So chapter 16 in the IRC said the duct system serving heat and cooling, ventilation, blah, 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 shall be fabricated. What does this word mean? Shall. It's not an option, right? In accordance with the provisions of this section and ACCA Manual D. So ACCA Manual D, the other book I have there, is a reference standard. The appliance manufacturer's installation instructions or other approved methods. Approved is the key word. That means you guys have to approve that method. And guess what all the manufacturers say? Refer to manual D. Refer to manual J. Um, if you open, did anybody have a copy of this back in their office? If you open it and you look up in the front of the people that worked on it, members of the committees and stuff like that, um, you will find Jack Martell words for York. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of them that work for power companies, they work for manufacturers, there's Lennox, Rain, Train. These are all manufacturers and they're helping write this book. And then they call on other industry experts and stuff like that. So it's really the residential standard. You know, the HBA kind of argues about, well, we have guys that know better ways to do it. There's a legislation that just went through on that, um, taking out the word approved in Manual J. Well, I don't know what standard they're going to use because this is the residential standard. So here's a duct system. What I'm trying to say is, Every time we turn the air at any one of these locations, we are going to have a certain amount of pressure drop. We're going to have a certain amount of resistance. Again, it's like your hose, your garden hose, or river, or water running down a river or a canal. If it turns sharp, water might run up over the bank. But if it's in a pipe, what happens? We have a bunch of turbulence and erosion and we have less flow. So the HVAC guy says, well, I'm just going to put a bigger blower on it. Does high pressure water force itself around a kink in a hose? Just makes more turbulence. It literally will shut it down if you have a lot of turbulence. So we, our duct design has to look at, <coughs> excuse me, everything from the pan joist, the grill on the wall, every turn, going through the filter, going through the coil on top of the furnace, making this turn, making that turn, reducers, turns, bends, everything. It has to look at everything. And if we build a duct system that's more restrictive, we don't get enough air out of it. And so it doesn't matter what size of air conditioning unit we put on or what size of furnace, if you can't get it out the end of the hose or the end of the duct, what does it matter? Um, there's some of this stuff I'm not really concerned about. Flex duct. My friend Jody Hilton out here. I've known Jody for, as a contractor, I knew Jody for probably 15 years, 20 years before I became an inspector. When I first became an inspector, he said, Brent, we've got to get rid of flex duct. And he says, why is that, Jody? He says, because no one ever installs it right. I've probably heard that 50 times or 100 times over the years. I've heard it at the code development hearings. People propose every time 
this outlaw flight stuff because it never gets installed right. Why doesn't it get installed right? Because it's not being enforced. Bang, right there. We need to enforce it. So we're going to talk about that. So every bit of this um, is twofold. The contractor doesn't know better. The inspector doesn't know better. The contractors think you can squash it a little bit and it doesn't matter. <laughs> How much education does an HVAC contractor in Utah have to have? A lot. Well, he has to have continuing education for his license. What does he have to do to get his license? Not that. Apply for it. Have two years experience contracting of some kind. The best thing to offer would ever do is actually start coming in. Drywall, concrete, if you have two years contracting experience, you can go down to Dolphin and you can get a license. Or do you come out of business? In HVAC. Yeah, they'll make you do a class to, on how to run a business. So you're successful. But you do not have to know anything about HVAC. We used to have a test. It wasn't a very comprehensive test, but I took a test. It was outdated. But for about five years now, four or five years. Did it have the three houses in it? What? Your test, did it have the three box houses in it? Senior looks like. No. But it did have, seriously, I took the test in 1982. And I started reading it and I'm going, what are they talking about? It had grading on gas lines. Do you know what I mean by that? Gas used to have moisture in it, and that's why they put the meters in the house. And so you would put, you literally installed the gas line so it drained over to that big, huge drip lane that they put at the furnace. You used to have to empty the meters because the, the, you go in there and the person come on, you watch the flames blowing yeah. through the gas. Because they had water in them. And then you go out and dump the meter and then you'd be fine. But here in Utah, <laughs> they put the meters in the basements because, so they wouldn't freeze. We use the best yeah. here. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a. Uh, anyway, you don't have to know anything. And, and so we have people that know nothing about any of this that we're talking about that are installing systems. Um, so let's try to understand this a little bit. So everything that we talk about when we do a duct design is based on friction loss per 100 feet of duct. And all of our tables and everything are based on that. So let's think about a duct. If we have a duct that's 100 feet long and we flow 1,000 CFM down it and we measure the pressure in the duct. And when I'm saying the pressure, the static pressure, the pressure that's pushing on the wall of the duct. Will the pressure here be different than the pressure here. And it's a little hard to wrap your head around, but let's let's say it going back to our analogy of a garden hose. If I have a garden hose that I stretch out 100 feet, and if I were to measure the pressure at the hose bib, and then again at the far end of the hose, we will actually have higher pressure here than there, and it's because of the friction loss of the losses due to the water moving down the, the duct. And for every 100 feet, you're gonna have a certain amount of pressure drop. And so every 100 feet or so, you have a pressure drop. And if it's 200 feet long, it'll be twice as much, and if it's 300 feet long, it'll be three times as much. And so we have a pressure drop every time we flow a fluid down a pipe. <clears throat> whether it's air or water. Now, if I cap the end and I have my fan running, then it's going to be the same at both ends. As soon as you open up the end, the pressure will drop down here and it'll stay higher here. And it's just because we have those losses as we push it through the duct. <clears throat> if friction wasn't a factor, once you've got a car rolling down the road, that's 80 miles an hour, you can take your foot off the gas and it would just keep going. But you, it doesn't, does it? Because the friction 
is pushing back on it. So we have friction as the air moves through there. So, um, and we have what is friction rate, and I'm not going to really get too worried about it, but if we have a 300 foot long duct, then we want to divide by three so that we know how much drop we have for every 100 feet. Just kind of keep that in mind as we move on. So what happens if I put a bunch of bands in it? I add to the friction loss for every 90. This might only be, from here to here, might only be 40 feet. But if I put a bunch of 90s in it, it might be equivalent to 300 feet. Does that make sense? Because it's like every time you put a little kink in the hose, and then maybe it's not a sharp kink, but it's a little bit of a kink, we get less water out of the hose, right? Exact same thing in a duct. And so when we take into account the kinks or the bands, this might be 100 feet long. This is 380 feet of equivalent length because of the bands that we put in the duct. And so by assigning a, a length or equivalent length to each fitting, we can come up with an total equivalent length so we can figure out how to size our duct. So that's the basic principle that we use for duct sizing. <clears throat> and we simply have to account for it in a total equivalent length. Our duct systems are not straight. Every time we do something to that duct, we have a we have a pressure drop, and the fittings will have that equivalent length. Um, and then we put devices in the airstream. Have you ever seen what's on top of your furnace with that air conditioning system? There's a coil that looks kind of like radiators or something like that. You have to blow air through. Well, it resists airflow because it has to go through all these little passages. We put a filter in there. You go into Home Depot, and what are they going to? You're going to have all the staring at you all over it around the heating stuff all these super efficient filters, right? That one inch pleated filtrite filter and kill the airflow in your, in your furnace. It's gonna restrict your airflow. Um, we have to account for that. Uh, so we have coils, filters, we have UV lights, uh, we don't assign a length, we actually assign a pressure drop to them. So here is, this is what we build off, and this is where manual S comes in. This is a furnace blower data. Blower data chart. And so here's a 60,000 BTU furnace with a 1200 CFM blower. That's what the 12 means, that's what the manufacturer's saying. And we measure external static pressure in inches of water column. Anybody remember the U2 manometer that you might have had in high school science or something like that? If you take a, and I don't think I put a slide in here, but if you take a, a U-tube, glass tube, and you fill it full of water, and you apply a pressure on one side, what happens? The column moves up, right? So what's what's gas pressure in a in your residential house right now? That's the manifold pressure. Point three, isn't it? The the gas pressure coming from your meter is four ounces. It's four ounces. So that's a quarter of a psi, right? <laughs> How much will four ounces move that column of water? Seven inches. You want to break in about a half hour? You got a half hour in you? So you want me to break at 2.30? Ish. So we'll break at 2.30 and then we'll have like a half hour after that to wrap up. Is that what you're saying? Sure. Is that what you're saying? No. Well, I someone told me that we ended early today. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, 20 minutes, half hour, just Whatever. somewhere in there, take a break. Okay, well, we'll take, maybe we'll take a break at 220, how's that? Sounds good. Okay, we'll break at 220. 
So I mean, bear with me, and I, I wish I had a board to draw on. Four ounces of gas pressure, which is, it's a, that's low, it's a quarter PSI, will displace that water, water column by seven inches. So 28 inches is one PSI. So 20, one PSI is a small amount of air pressure, isn't it? Well, we are measuring pressure drop in ducts in fractions of an inch of water column. So we're saying, if we look at this blower, we're saying at 0.5 inches of water column of resistance against that airflow, our CFM goes, here's 0.1, a tenth of an inch, we'll move 490. When we restrict it, so that we have a pressure drop of a half inch of water column, we reduce our airflow by over 200 CFM. If we continue to restrict it, more pressure drop, more pressure loss because of the length of the duct, our airflow goes down and down. So if we put in a really restrictive duct system, we just, we kill the airflow. And that's just the design. That air that's blowing out of there isn't blowing very hard. You know, it really isn't. And, and so it really needs a nice open piece of duct, otherwise you'd really kill the airflow. So everybody understands, as soon as you put, start putting a duct on it, the airflow goes way, way down. Those cheap bath fans that we were talking about earlier, they just rattle and make a bunch of noise and they cost $13 at Home Depot. They claim they're 50 CFM fans. As soon as you put any flex on them or straight pipe, they crash and they move like 20 CFM. They hardly move anything. If you've paid attention to what the code says, it now has a little table for bath fans that says if you have a 50 CFM fan or you want to move 50 CFM fan, you can't even put three inch duct on it because it's too restrictive. Like four inch duct for 50, yeah, four inch can go 56 feet, but you got to do what? Account for every elbow. Yeah. Can, you, can you on those three inch? I've, so, never, I've never allowed them to, but sometimes you'll see guys put like a four inch vent on that three-inch fan. You know where, so, so like so the housing is three inches. I just went through this with a contractor and I made him get in the manufacturer specs for it. As long as that housing has the adapter for the four-inch or is adaptable for the four-inch, it says it moves the 50 CFM still. But it has to move 50 CFM at 0.25. Yeah. And the cheap vent is rated 50 CFM at 0.1. But the code says it has to move 50 CFM at 0.25. So it has to be able to move 50 at more resistance. Yeah. And, I haven't. And just them going up to like a different site pipe doesn't solve the problem. Because it's the capacity of the fan against, yeah. against <laughs> friction drop. So, um, I mean, it's all the same. What we're doing with bath fans is the same thing that we're doing here. We're trying to make sure we get the air moving down there. And, Go ahead. I have a question on that where everybody turns them down into the soffit. Would you consider that an elbow or yep. a 90? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. That very same chart says you can run five feet of three inch. Three inch. How do you run five feet of three inch without an elbow on a bath pad? Stub it right out of the kitchen. <laughs> no, I'm being sarcastic. I mean, that's just about it. Yeah. And what did they tell you? You have to deduct for every elbow in that bath pad. 15 feet. Yeah. 15 feet for every elbow. Yeah. When you figure they're running them up through trusses and up and over, and you've got to watch how they're running. They have they have 10 elbows in it. I've seen all these townhouses you know, and this one thing with the OBC, and the generation code, that when you get these vents out, and they should call for a thing where it says you can't be at 6 feet when you're in the door, and you have to stick everybody out there, and right? thanks for them, so here's the window, and here's the bed. I uh, the the comment is about the code actually says you can't for an environmental air 
You can't be within three feet of an opening window. No, it's a change of safety, isn't it? No, it's three. But guess what? Who opens their window? I think, well, I, I think it's kind of dumb. <laughs> I think, I, I really think that's going to go away because it's really difficult in townhomes and everything. I mean, we're not opening our windows, and what are we blowing out? Air that's in our house. It's environmental air. It's not going to kill you. It might not be pleasant, but but we're. <laughs> I tried. I tried a code change proposal on this, and it didn't go very far. And I don't know if I have the energy or the years in me to try to run another one through that combustion air thing where you have to put in a sealed room. That took me nine years to get that one in the code. So you can thank me for that one. But. Um, if you look at your 90% efficient furnace and that sidewall termination, what are the distances it requires from all these windows? A foot? A foot. Depends on the BTUs. If it's lower BTUs, it can be six inches, can it? So I think the bath fan three feet from an opening window is, I think it's dumb. I'm sorry. I, I, and. It's really difficult to work around it on these townhomes and apartments because you have you have 12 feet of wall on the outside and it has windows in it because it's the only windows and that's where you have to terminate everything so you don't have any wall space left. So, um, yeah. Anyway, we kind of got off, but that's okay. We want to answer your questions. You see, this whole table, depending on this this furnace right here, is supposed to move 2,000 cfm. And it does here. And this table goes down further. But you see how soon as you put resistance on it, the airflow goes down and down and down. These duct systems we are putting, seeing put in are going off the right side of the table. And once you go past one inch, the design of that blower wheel falls on its face. It can't move any more air. You can't put a huge motor on there and get it to force more air down there. It just sits there and cavitates and does nothing. So by the design, it's less than one inch of external static pressure that it can function against. Um, so I just wanted to be a little familiar with that table. So what a guy does when he does a design nowadays, he typically has to go by the time you put a filter and everything on it, 0.5 doesn't work. He's having to go over into here someplace. This says this furnace, these two furnaces will work for a three ton air conditioner. But a three ton, we want to move at least 1200 CFM. When we install it in real life, we're over in this place someplace and we're way short of 1200 CFM. We're short of 1200 CFM. This one is supposedly moves 1600 CFM, but we're short in CFM when we get in the real world and install it in the real world. You with me? So what am I saying we have to do? They have to go to a bigger blower to really get the system to work. And so that's why they might say, well, I have to go to the 80,000 that will move 1600 at point 0.5 or close to it. But I have point 0.8 with coil and filter and duct and everything. I'm only doing a three ton, not a four ton. And so that's the biggest reason that we have to go to bigger furnaces is because we can't get enough air out of our furnaces. So if their friction rate is on the higher end, then we should expect to see they're going to have to upsize that up bigger furnace. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's just no way around it. The manufacturers. Huh? Right? It keeps the furnace from short cycling. Too. Yeah. Yeah, it won't it won't limit or whatever. But the the problem is the manufacturers are doing what? They're building furnaces for human climates. Guess what we want to do in a human climate? We want it running all the time, but we want less airflow because we want the air going a little slower across the coil so the moisture can condense out and drop out. We want high airflow because our air is thin. We need to transport heat with that air. And 
we're not worried about moisture. You're running the coil at higher temperature typically. Well, we're running around 40 degrees. What the coil runs a little warmer. They want to run the coil a little colder, and so we're kind of at the mercy of the manufacturers because they don't make enough airflow in the furnaces. Um, so manufacturers trying to catch up with like, the, the smaller furnaces and installing bigger blowers. I only touched on a little bit earlier. You talked about the, the variable, not the variable speed furnace, but the well, they have the variable drive furnaces, yeah. and they help some, but but the manufacturer like, really is more focused on the ninety percent of the country that that doesn't need the airflow that we need. I mean, that's really. Well, I, That's I really understand that, but at some point, they will, don't they have to realize that there are different circumstances for different climate zones? Yeah. And the code should force them to, to, to do that, correct? Well, and we just have to allow them to put in more insurance that they don't necessarily yeah, but need. I, well, there are, what we're going to do is we're going to see more and more moving away from conventional standard heating system with lots of zoning and with the mini split type things, and we're going to move more and more. Um, ACCA just had a myself, Ryan Rentmeister, Rentmeister's up in Syracuse. He was on the committee. We had a we did a supplement to this on. It's called low load homes. Our homes have such a low load. You know, so, well this house is it. The load is pretty low, but you know we insulate it even better. I mean our heating loads only twenty nine thousand BTUs. We have homes that have a 16,000 BTU heating load. How do you address that? And we still need to move some air just for circulation. And so I don't know if the manufacturers are going to fix it. I kind of, I don't have a lot of faith in them because I mean, in the eighties, I could buy a one ton condensing unit and I used them on apartments all the time. We have apartments that have a 6,000 or a half a ton BTU cooling load. And the smallest condenser they make, the major manufacturers, is one and a half tons. So it's three times oversized, and that's the smallest unit I can buy. It just seems like they're making everybody catch up with the water fixtures and things like that. It just, it's just, but like you said earlier, I guess you don't have to have a phone to be schooling. Yeah, it's, it's uh, we, we, uh, I wish I could solve it. I've worked my whole life trying to, to make it better, but. And we're doing better as, as inspectors in general. When I started inspecting um, back in 2005, someone might ask for a load calculation, but no one ever spent any time looking at it. Is that safe to say? Um, so our objective, and uh, we might run out of time, whatever. Residential equipment, uh, Provide a blower package, furnace, or air handle which can deliver a certain volume of air at a certain level of resistance. And that's just what we're talking about. We want to be able to deliver a certain amount of air. And where we're high and dry, we just simply need more air. Um, duct systems, all the stuff that creates resistance, we have to be aware of. And um, we have to be aware of what the blower moves. So basically, the designer is responsible to size the duct system and accessories to fit the blower package or select the blower that will fit the duct design. So oftentimes, they have to go to a bigger blower. Let's take, um, let me see, let's just look at a couple of pictures. This is the furnace coil coming up, and it turns. This is the most critical fitting in the whole system. That put a little short radius elbow in there. That helps, but it's not great. This return air coming back that put a big fitting here because the air is coming and turning down. And by oversizing this starter here, it slowed the air down where it makes the turn. So that helps a little bit. What do you think the equivalent length of every one of those is? 35 feet per elbow. How many elbows do we have? We have four elbows in every one of those runs. Could this 
guy installing this, could he have taken that elbow and twisted the rings on the elbow and turned it into a 45 or a 30 degree elbow? And reduce that by half or more. Just a little bit more straight. It doesn't elbow. turn as sharp. It's better as well. you, know, you can take those elbows and you can turn them so that they're completely straight and anywhere in between. You should have done some flex stuff and hang down. Yeah, if you take flex stuff and hang it down and then you make the strap really tight <laughs> so you don't have to drop the ceiling so you don't have as much room. Yeah. yeah. Just drill through the beam. <laughs> we really should, the beam should have been dropped down, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a critical elbow. What do you think the equivalent length around that elbow is? It's between 80 and 90 feet every time you make that turn. No, the turn is big. Oh, there's no veins in it. I know. <laughs> but, you know, if this was a sweeping radius, it's every bit as good or better than turning veins. Here's a T, same thing. That's a kink in the duct, right? Let's take a break. Yeah.